Hello and welcome to this video where we're going to look at how do we even choose the right dewormer for our horses or our horses clients. And there are three big questions in life, or at least in the life of parasite control. These are the questions. So first of all, what parasites are we even wanting to treat? I mean, we need to know what parasites are there before we can we can choose an appropriate uh, product. And not just do we need to know what parasites are there, sometimes we even wanna know whether there's any particular stages of infection, sometimes the larval stages that we are interested in treating or reducing. And then what is the resistance status? So on this particular premise, I often get the question, you know, you know what are the or resistance levels in this area or that area or this type, or this part of the world? Well, I mean, it doesn't really work like that. You need to go and test that particular operation, those horses and the parasites that they carry. Yes, uh, there are general patterns and pictures that we can see across the world where we can say that some uh, parasites are more likely to be resistant to some uh, drug classes than others. And yes, uh, actually with that in mind that's a perfect segue so uh, introducing the probability chart now we don't know what the resistance levels are without testing but we can use this probability chart to say you know which are the most likely to be resistant and uh, to which um, dewormers and which which parasites or and which are the least so you can see here that uh, some say hi you know, if uh, there's a high probability of resistance, that probably wouldn't be your first choice unless you have demonstrated that on this particular premise operation, this product actually does work despite the global findings of high resistance. Where it says low, it means that resistance has been reported, but at this stage, maybe not as widely or as often or as much as to some of these other classes. So looking across, we've had, we have either high or low. We, we don't really have anything in the middle, which is interesting. And where we see the two dashes is just because there really isn't any information. Um, so if there aren't any information, we really don't know, uh, but at least there um, hasn't been any issues or concerns reported of, of maybe lack of efficacy of this for, this is for the, the, the pinworms in, in, in particular. So if we go parasite by parasite category here, then we can kind of look at it in that regard. So starting out with the small star jaws, we then could talk about what are the best bets in terms of treatment and what are the worst bets. Best bets here is the macrocyclic lactones. So ivermectin and moxidectin are the ones that work the best at this stage. However, resistance has been reported recently in several different studies, and this is certainly something to watch because that could get worse and be more widely reported, and then we might be doomed in terms of not really having anything else. Because if we look at the two other classes, the chromidines and the benzimidazoles, there's widespread resistance to both of those classes for most of the world. There might be some regional differences when it comes to the pyrimidines, the pyrantel sols, that in some countries it may not have been used as much historically and in those countries those areas uh, the efficacy may be better because of that but overall resistance has been reported widely to both the pyrimidines and the benzimidazoles so we have one class left here that is likely to work at least somewhat well now for large strong gels uh, the situation is much better, uh, much different, because everything seems to still work. Now, with the caveat that we don't really have a lot of resistance studies um, in this particular group of parasites, the, the issue here is that uh, even if horses have them, uh, it's a very small percentage of all the parasites that they have. And so when we look at egg counts, which we, by the way, we can't differentiate large and small parasites just on the egg counts, but even if we could, a very small proportion of those eggs are actually from large strong jaws. So statistically, we sometimes really can't determine whether there's full efficacy or not. But it appears that as long as we treat at a certain intensity level, 
we can keep the large drawing tiles away. The only thing to be aware of is that some of the classes that we have have efficacy against the migrating larvae. Now these strongyla species, three species of the large strongyla, uh, spend a lot of time in their life cycle migrating around the body of the horse before they return to the large intestine where they reproduce and produce eggs. And so that can take many, many months, in some cases up to 9, 10, 11 months in some of the species. And some of the product lines, some of the classes have efficacy against these larvae, such as ivermectin, moxidectin, and in some cases also fenbendazole, and other classes don't. Um, so other benzimidazoles, single dose benzimidazoles, and pyrantil products do not have that larvicidal efficacy. So there's that, but that doesn't have anything to do with resistance. But if you were to choose a product <clears throat> wanting to treat for, for example, for blood worms, Strongylus vulgaris, you might want to find a product that does have that larvicidal efficacy as well as efficacy against the adult parasites in the intestinal tract. The adult parasites don't really cause any harm. And the harm is caused by the migrating larvae, so we probably would like to get those treated. Now, moving on to the ascarids, um, again, the best bets are, in this case, two classes, benzimidazoles and, and the pyrimidines, the parentel. Worst bets are the macrocyclic lactones. We have widespread resistance in ascarids to this class all over the world. It doesn't seem to matter where we look. Uh, we, if we do a study with ivermectin and or moxidectin, we find evidence of resistance in ascarids. So the other two classes seem to be doing okay. However, there are recent reports of resistance uh, to these two classes as well in ascarids. So that's, you know, there is no safe bets here and you need to check the efficacy regardless of which product you end up prescribing or recommending. So moving on to the tapeworms, we have two products depending on the country the strong the the sorry the parent tell um in the in america it's it's uh, often a product named strongit there are other products out there though but a uh, parent tell pamoate or embonate uh in a double dose is registered labeled licensed for treatment of tapeworms in some countries and not in others although it has been well established and documented that it does have this efficacy um, and then we've got the prosequinol, which is combined usually with a macrocyclic lactone uh, in, in most countries. And we, we used to see it as a standalone dewormer product in some countries way back when in the past, but uh, we don't have any um, just prosequinol products. So they're always in combination with others. Uh, these are the two options. And we don't really have a best bet or a worst bet. They seem to be doing equally well. Uh, one study, and it is just one study, and it's a very recent study in 2023, uh, documented evidence of treatment failure of prostaglandin and the double dose parental pamoate against equine tapeworms in Kentucky, U.S. So this might be something we'll keep, we could be seeing more of in the future. So so really stay tuned for that. But so far, and one doesn't really stand out over the other. And then we have pinworms. Now, pinworms is really more of a nuisance than an actual pathogen causing disease. However, it can be detrimental enough if you have these horses that keep on rubbing their behinds and their tails and they're self-mutilating, causing wounds and lesions, etc. So, and they don't seem to really ever stop itching. So, um, Ivermectin moxidectin, we have widespread evidence of resistance to this class. And we don't really have any studies suggesting resistance to the other two classes. However, uh, we do have veterinarians in some countries, particular, particularly in the United Kingdom for some reason, that claim that nothing really seems to work in horses diagnosed with uh, pinworm infection. And so neither of the three classes actually worked, which is concerning. However, in the published scientific literature, the only thing we have documented is resistance to ivermectin moxidexin, and it is on four different continents around the world, so it appears to be quite widespread. So those were the different parasites. So how do we, how do we actually test for drug resistance? 
So here in 2023, a new set of guidelines were just published uh, by the WAAVP, so that's the World Association for the Advancement of Veterinary Parasitology. Um, it's a big body that does a lot of different things, and one of them is to publish guidelines. So we published a set of guidelines with uh, several new principles um, this year. First of all, um, as opposed to previous, gui previous guidelines, we actually define the expected level of treatment efficacy on historic data. So how did the product actually do when it was first launched before any resistance developed? That is the expected level of efficacy. And that may differ between different drug classes and also between different parasite categories and not to really mention the different host animals. Now, in this video, we only focus on horses, but there's also guidelines for sheep and cattle and pigs and small animals, etc., etc., etc. So, uh, so those are different. And then we have this new principle of uh, the number of parasite eggs counted. So that may seem a little odd, because you know what are we talking about here? Parasite egg counts. Yes, we we know that that matters. Now, what we mean here is how many objects you count with the technique that you're using typically with a microscope so under the microscope how many eggs do you count and use your tally clicker perhaps and and then you might multiply with a certain conversion factor to get the eggs per gram of feces afterwards but we're really interested in not so much the eggs per gram of feces but how many eggs you counted to get there the reason is that the statistical unit of interest is that, how many eggs did you count? Because if you count a decent number of eggs, it gets so much easier to determine whether there's a reduced efficacy, a, decl a decline of treatment efficacy from historic levels. If you only count four eggs uh, in a, in a horse, it, you, it, you may get to a couple hundred grams, grams eggs per gram of feces, but only four eggs, that's four statistical units. That's difficult to really discern if there's a reduction or not. And whereas if you count 200 eggs or 50 eggs with a different technique, you're much better off. And that really determines your statistical power. And, and by the statistical power, there is also a consideration of how many horses should be included in a fecal egg count reduction test, which is what we call the test. And how do you determine how many horses is enough? So, so all of these thing, things comes into play, and I know this probably sounded very, very complicated. It really isn't. Um, you can summarize it in a couple tables. So if we look at, um, by the way, first of all, um, the last thing that is introduced with these new guidelines is that we look at these confidence intervals. Now that's not really new by itself, but, um, but how we interpret those con confidence intervals is different. Uh, and we also operate with two different, different thresholds. The top threshold is the expected level of efficacy. And then we define a gray area. Uh, and the gray area is, you know, we allow some wiggle room for some variability. And, and if something falls within that gray area, then uh, the, the results may be inconclusive. And then we look at the confidence intervals. And actually, we interpret the confidence limits more so than the actual mean counts. All the details can be reviewed in the guideline paper. Um, there's also going to be veterinary practitioner friendly versions of these uh, published in both uh, the United Kingdom and the US in, uh, in the parasite control guideline documents that we're working on. So, so there's going to be some more user friendly versions of this. And um, now looking at the thresholds for strong giles. So we have here the three different classes. Um, we have the expected level, level of efficacy thresholds. And what you notice here is that they're different. Higher expected level of efficacy for ivermectin moxidectin than, for example, for, for, the, for the prior cell, the pyrimidines there on the, on the far right. That's just because that's how the, the efficacy numbers looked like in the beginning uh, when the, the products were first launched. And then you see these lower uh, thresholds that also uh, are, are different. And and because of these different levels of efficacy, um, for a certain number of eggs counted per group, and that's what you see at the bottom, 200 uh, for ivermectin moxidex and 280 for the other two groups, and the number of the minimum number of horses needed for the test, five, seven, and seven, 
Again, you need more horses and you need to count more eggs when you don't have that same high level of efficacy. You have more variability in the data. That's why you need, you need more eggs and more horses to increase and have enough statistical power. Uh, this is for just one scenario where you're able to count enough eggs. If you can't count this many eggs, you need more horses in, 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 the, in the groups. And if you don't have enough horses, um, you need at least five horses. That's that's the basic minimum. But if you don't have seven, for example, you can you can just count some more eggs. And so depending on the technique and how you do that, you, you do have some options. Now for ascorids, it is much easier because the uh, original levels of e efficacy were completely alike. And so the thresholds that we said are the same, which means that the number of eggs counted required is the same and the minimum number of horses is also the same across the different classes so ascrit testing is easier if you will less complicated uh, and you can read the guideline paper for more details now uh, a lot of you will probably be asking so what if what if we just don't have five horses that are egg count positive or, or if we just don't have five horses period what if we just have one horse and is it even worth testing them? And if you ask, um, if you ask like a parasitologist uh, and, and a scientific based parasitologist, they could say, well, no, then you can't do a fecal egg count reduction test. But my response is always, well, then let's call it something else then. Because you can still do a test pre and post treatment and it is still meaningful to do uh, you may not regard it as a resistance test, but it could be interesting, for example, with a newly introduced horse that has been brought to the premise, has been imported or bought or acquired somewhere, and it's now undergoing a couple of quarantine checkups. One of those could be an egg count, a treatment, and a post-treatment egg count. That's a, that's a fecal egg count reduction test of one horse. Now, we just need to interpret that result with a lot of caution, right? But we're not expecting egg counts to be positive approach treatment. And if we do find that, that does tell us something useful. So some, some general basic guidelines that we give there is to say, well, if you want to do that, we, you know, it's preferable that you count a good number of eggs in that horse, so 40, which is, uh, depending on the technique, could be a lot of eggs to count. Um, some horses are not very high egg count horses. And then, of course, you could still do it. But if you can get above 40 eggs, you're better off. And you should expect that uh, reduction to be at least 95%, regardless of what dewormer you use. Now, having said that, this doesn't mean that we think it's okay to just do a number of individual tests pre and post treatment on a boarding stable, where you know, there's a lot of horses that actually are grazing together, they're turned out together, and but they just have different owners that each have their own veterinarian and nothing, uh, coordinated is going on in terms of parasite control and testing that is problematic you know parasites are shared between horses that are grazing together they know they don't get the same numbers of parasites or not necessarily even the same species but they do share the parasite burdens and so whenever we do a resistance test it is a test of the parasite population it is not a test of the horses and so if you do have horses that are turned out together we should really get a group of that those horses tested together um, and it, it is not a valid alternative to just go single horse single horse single horse and, and even have different veterinary clinics perform the tests uh, however sometimes there is only just one horse or one egg count positive horse or the horses are turned out alone with with no or little contact to other horses so it really depends on the on the circumstances now uh, in closing are there any risks with deworming? Could anything go bad? And yes, there are, you know, adverse reactions that could happen and, and let's look at them. So first of all, uh, we can see toxicity. So in overdosing, especially with the macrocyclic lactones with ivermectin, moxidexin, but we're looking at five to 10 times the, the labeled dose. But when you get these elevated dosages, you can see neurologic manifestations in these horses, most pronounced with moxidexin because it's more lipophilic than ivermectin. But even with ivermectin, we can see ataxia, uh, numbness of the muscle has been described, so really almost like a paralysis of the facial muscles. 
So, um, and, and, and then horses that want to want to lie down, lateral recumbency and things like that. Uh, in foals, this can be life threatening. I have seen foals die because of receiving uh, an adult horse's dose of a one of these dewormers, particularly with moxidectin. So, so that is a risk. And one also has to be careful with uh, very thin horses, old, thin and debilitated horses, horses that don't have a lot of body fat. Now, because these these products are lipophilic, they really they really like to hang out in fat tissue. And if there is no fat tissue in the horse, there's really only one place they can go, and that's the brain, which does contain fat or or myelin um, fat like like substances that the the drugs can then accumulate in, and that is of course deeply problem problematic. So that can happen. Now, um, many people are concerned about adverse reactions to dying worms and is that a thing and well it's only really been documenting documented with partic with one particular parasite which we actually haven't talked about today that is the uh, so-called neg threat worm the onchocerca cervicalis it's a filarid um, parasite where the adult worm lives in, along the ligamentum nuke in the neck and it releases these microfilari that goes into the subcutaneous tissues. And then sometimes if you deworm with a macrocyclic lactone that kills the microfilari, it doesn't affect the adult parasites, but it kills these microfilari, these, these offspring. And then sometimes you can see these skin manifestations um, in response to the dying microfilari. That has been documented. Um, it's like a, an allergic reaction. It mimics to, in, to some extent, it can mimic summer eczema. Uh, which is the insect bite hypersensitivity that we see in some some horses in some areas of the world. Now that has been described, but what people are really mostly worried about is not that. It's like it's all these Cyathostome and small Strandii larvae that are insisted in the mucosal walls of the large intestine, and and people are worried about what might happen if we deworm and kill a lot of those, and. We actually have studied that in several different studies and really not find, found any signs of adverse reaction, any inflammatory response to these, these dying stages. And as I showed you before, none of the larvicide products that we have today are completely effective. They don't remove all the larvae anyway. So maybe it's not that bad. However, what has been demonstrated is that if you treat with a dewormer that does not affect um, these larvae, uh, but removes the luminal stages, so the adult worms and the pre-adult worms that live in the intestinal lumen, and you remove them effectively, sometimes you can trigger this mass emergence of insisted larvae. So you, you, you stimulate the larvae to all want to come out at once, and if you have several hundred thousands, you can get an acute, profuse, watery diarrhea, which is a disease that we call larvocyathostomonosis. It is... Um, it happens it is rare in in some countries rarer than others uh, i would say it is extremely rare in north america it almost doesn't happen at all for some reason in north america whereas it is more common although still rare in northern europe um, in the temperate climates such as scandinavia germany uh, netherlands and the united kingdom at least when i talk to colleagues in those countries they tell me that they still see this complex so, so that can happen so in other words, you, you remove the adult worms and the larvae emerge from the mucosal walls and that causes inflammation of the entire mucosal lining of the large intestine. So that is one issue that can happen, although rarely. And then colic, can colic occur in response to deworming? Yes, uh, that can happen. We have seen that sometimes. Um, very mild episodes of colic can, can occur uh, two parasites can cause impaction of the small intestine. Now, uh, those are relatively large parasites. So those are the ascarids on one hand that live in the small intestine. And you have a large burden and you kill them all. They can clog the small intestine. And that is actually a very painful uh, condition that often requires surgery and at least hospitalization of the foal. Uh, tapeworms... Uh, like to live just inside the cecum, just inside the large intestine, but sometimes when burdens are large, you actually see some of those tapeworms living in the ileum, which is the, the lowest part of the small intestine. 
and the ilium is a little stiff and rigid and you can get an impaction of tapeworms there and that has been described to actually happen in response to effective treatment of these tapeworms so two parasites can cause impactions now i want to emphasize here that the strongyle parasites the small and large strongyles particularly the small strongyles that we see the most uh, they live in the large intestine which are huge organs and the parasites are so small that we can often barely see them at all with the naked eye we need microscopes um, and uh, they do not ever cause impaction sometimes there's some misconceptions around this so the strong jaws do not cause intestinal impactions so but those are the the adverse reactions that can happen so when you talk to a, a client and owner they do need to be aware that when you deworm there might be a, a, a reason to to keep these animals um just sort of under under surveillance for uh, a period of time, maybe uh, 24 hours or so, post deworming, just to see if any of them might respond to to deworming with either signs of colic or diarrhea. Um, uh, but it, it does happen extremely rarely. That was it for this video. I hope that helped. Um, again, testing is the answer. If you really want to. Uh, get the right answer in terms of what product to choose but here at least uh, you had some consideration considerations to go from uh, so thank you for your attention bye